Welcome to our celebration of Carl Sagan's 88th birthday, which is on Wednesday, November 9th. Um, the first thing I'm going to have you all do is, if you would like to get some apple pie, you can go filter over and then come on. And it's just like more of a big action, so you can really appreciate it. Let's um, so we'll start out with that. Thank you. I have the honor of introducing our lecturer for tonight, Professor Lisa Kalkinator. Uh, Professor Kalkinator came to Cornell in 2014, and she was the founding director of the Carl Sagan Institute in 2015. Um, and her work is in trying to find exoplanets that resemble Earth and might have life on them. So that's what we're talking to you about today. Um, so let's all give a hand to Professor Hawkins. Thank you, Phyllis, and thanks to the amazing team of undergrads here who actually put all these lecture years together and who will let you look for a telescope every Friday. They are there. Well, and then that, but Friday, the public nights at Quercus. So, if you like to look for a telescope and experience the magic that astronomers have experienced every time they look up and see planets in the sky and other stars, every Friday here on campus, you can do that with an enthusiastic and very knowledgeable team of students who love astronomy and who love to share that with you. And this is, of course, part of the series with some of the people who do. Astronomy professionally uh, can tell it where we can get to tell you a little bit about our work. And of course, today is an amazing opportunity. So, of course, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you first have to invent the whole universe. Because everything that is heavier, every atom heavier than hydrogen and helium, a little bit of burning and lithium, but who cares? Everything else is made in the core of the star, in the hot parts of the star, or once it explodes in the death throes of the star. So everything you are made out of that, and the apple pie that you have for the this season, or that you like to eat, is only possible because the stars will never die. And in this last big explosion that sees the universe with these heavier atoms, that in the end made you and me. A friend of mine had a very funny story about that. He was like, Well, when I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, you know, my face is maybe a few decades old, but really it's billions of years staring back at me. So if you feel bad in the morning, it's billions of years staring back at you. You know, it was not just as deep as that. It's fun. So let me go to uh, this idea, this whole idea about the life of the universe. And of course, Carl Sagan was a visionary. He already envisioned that we could find so many different worlds out there. And we have found more than 5,000 so far. More than 5,000 planets around other stars that are not our sun. Our sun is, of course, our closest star. But 5,000 more out there. And so I put a cheeky subtitle that like 4.5 billion years of solitude. Question mark. We are hard working on trying to figure out if another planet is another world out there. We could find signs that we can only explain in life. And I'll show you a little bit how we do that today. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to break down this notion, even so I adore it, of the pale blue dot, the gorgeous poem that Carl Sagan wrote about our own world. Because maybe, just maybe, we should be a little bit uh, more colorful, experimental. Think about an ocean world that could be covered with a red algae bloom. That would be red to us, right? What about a planet where there's something yellow glistening under a kind of weird atmosphere? So light, and that's what I'm going to show you today, is incredible diversity diverse on this earth. And so our pale blue dot, even though it looks like a pale blue dot from space because of all the water, actually 
actually already holds the key and the secret of what otherwise could be out there, even though they might not be an exact carbon copy of what we have here. And so we are very close to the portrait observatory. So you can go and invite in it, and they will show you some of the worlds in the outer solar system where we are looking for life. I won't we'll talk about this today, but feel free to ask me any questions and such. But we are here to celebrate uh, one of the visionaries and one of the people who brought so many scientists and engineers from all the world together and who we named our institute after, the Carl Sagan Institute. And I know you know a lot about Carl Sagan and Gillis, and neither part of Portis is going to give you a bit more of an insight in some funny stories about his life, so you should go to Portis after this. But basically, Carl Sagan was here at Cornell since 1968 until his death. He taught here and he inspired people, not just few, but of course, all over the world. He published more than 600 scientific papers, so I have a while to go, but I'm working on it. And I think the 20 books I'm probably not going to catch up on. And then if you go further and further down, inspiring millions of people all over the world with the cosmos theories. Just some of the amazing things he has done in his life and some of the amazing things he left us as legacy, legacy to basically move forward. And of course, as we are celebrating his birthday today, we should not go without hearing him talk about the tale of the duck himself. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization. Every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader. Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. 
to me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. And so, with this beautiful description of our own world, I would like to take you to the other things we can sense and cover and how we can use what we know. And this, of course, is what the child calls in, but the teacher very far out. But then all through people, all through history, thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, tens of years ago, who were building this science step by step, who thrived on a huge network of ideas, who lived in the street and the stars. And here at Cornell, we have built one of these teams, the Call Saving Institute, where we're trying to find life in our solar system and beyond. And here we just see the phone of the 35 faculty and senior researchers here, uh, many of them graduate students and undergrads who make up this vibrant interdisciplinary team trying to find out whether or not we are known in the universe. And if you want more information, we have a website called Second Institute for Knowledge and there's also a Twitter link where you can follow what's going on. But Kelsey was talking about us, us on this tiny dot around a pretty normal star in the sun. However, and that we also should take care of our own planet, and I completely, completely agree. However, I think we have something going for us. What we have going for us is that we have actually figured out what will happen, how our Earth works, and what will happen in the future. Yes, we currently are doing It's not going to be very good for the people online. Let's try this. Oh, yeah. Okay. This one? Okay. So, one of the things that I will show you too is that life and the planet interact. Half the lack of billions of years. But we have a good advantage that we figured out that we are in. Because once you figure it out, we can actually do something about it and make sure that we keep your environment nice enough for you to live in. Two billion years ago, small biota changed the atmosphere of our planet completely. So we needed the oxygen that got us to us, right? Multiple complex life. 95% of all that biota died. Single cell organisms did not realize what was happening. We have an advantage. We realize what's happening. And by studying other plants in our solar system, we also figure out what to do with them. And one other thing that I love is that we went so far as to actually send a bottle, a message of a bottle into space. Hello from the children of planet Earth. The government and the people of Canada to the extraterrestrial inhabitants. Bonjour tout le monde. Shalom. Hola y saludos a todos. Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> so this is Voyager, nineteen seventy seven leaving our Earth and shot into space about 45 years ago, having a golden record for human Christ message, message in the bottle, what it means to be human on board. And I see Jeff sending the message, even though it might never be found because it's a tiny, tiny satellite in the vastness of space, tells you something very hopeful about this species that is looking to figure out when they're not as alone. And so how do we do that? How do we even find planets and things? Well, we actually don't see them 
most of the time. But it is a trick. So if a planet actually goes around the star, it tugs on the star. Think about it this way. If somebody goes and walks a dog in the park, right? And the dog wants to go a direction you don't want to go, you will do this, right? So they will like to So actually, you don't necessarily have to see the dog. If I'm standing like this in the park, right? You will infer there's something that's pulling me and I'm not just walking like this completely, right? That's not what's gonna happen. And now imagine for one minute, okay? The dog runs around me like crazy and I'm not getting up. Then what I will do is this, right? Trying to keep it from running around. Now, star planet. It's not a dog, it's not a leash, gravity is two bodies, but we are in balance. So, planet holds, stars lean back. They really don't. They move around the center of mass. That's a really good way of thinking about it. So, so you will see, even though the planet is too small to see, you will see the star wobble, like a jiggle, you know? It wobbles back and forth, and you're like, what's happening? Do the jars, stars, wobble? They don't. All the other ones don't. So you can figure out how massive the object must be that move. And this is how we found the first one around another star, just about the Nobel Prize. This wobbling of the star that you see here, you see the star going basically around the center of mass that the planet is. And so, even though you can see the planet, you can figure out that it's there. But by chance, and that's really just the by chance thing, sometimes we get lucky and see the star and the planet just right. And what happens then is that the planet goes between our line of sight and the star. So the star is top and bright. But if you don't see the part of the hard bright surface, the overall brightness you see from the star will become a little bit less for a short amount of time. We call it a transit. And so when the planet goes between us and the star, we see the star as a little bit less bright. And we see part of the light from the star being filtered through the air of that planet. And light travels, it travels for break. The only thing you need to do is to look at the telescope to catch it. The bigger the telescope, the more light you can catch. And so the dimmer an object, the less light it's going to travel. So the bigger a telescope you need to catch the light it sends. But if you had a big enough telescope, you could actually figure out what is the universe for these planets. And that's exactly what we just launched in the summer last year. As we say, all astronomers are in front of them. Okay, maybe not all. All astronomers I know. We're in front of the computer earlier up than any children you could ever imagine. And I'm just like, please don't explode. Please don't explode. Whatever happens, right? It's a rocket launch. It's a big telescope on top of a rocket. And then luckily it was a beautiful Christmas after this thing launched gorgeously. But what we found, just by the indirect magnets, magnets that I just showed you, by the wobble of the star, and then if the planet by chance goes in front of the star, what we found is something kind of weird. Because think about it, if you go to the park um, and there's a huge dog pulling you, right? I'm going to do this. Tiny dog pulling me, I'm going to be like, nah, 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 nah. So it's going to be way easier for you to see the big dog, right? So it's much easier for astronomers to find the big planets. Same goes for when the planet blocks out the light from the star. Bigger planet, less light comes to us because more gets blocked out, easier to find again. But when you go and say, okay, so how big are these planets that we're finding? This here, this side is big. On the right, it's basically Jupiter. You see it at 11 uh, Earth's radii here. And then at one Earth's radius, the Earth, that's the dot on top of this diagram. And what you see is the number of planets we found. So you see that actually, the smaller the planet, the more of them there are. 
And I've shaded this region because once the planet gets very small, it's harder and harder to find, so we haven't found all of them yet. This can only go up. So apparently, the universe makes many more small planets than big ones. What's great for me, because I do like Jupiter, but I love Earth. So smaller planets gives you a lot more chances for cool Earth, because if a planet gets big enough, it will catch a lot of the gas around it, and then it will actually become a gas ball like Jupiter or Saturn. And we found more than 5,000 planets already. 5,000. And we are not that good at looking at Yes, we are good, but not that good at looking at We could be so much better. So what that just tells you is that there must be so many out there if we already found 5,000. And here I gave you a number for candidates. And so there are about 9,000 candidates right now. What does candidates mean? That means we haven't gotten to actually check the data in enough detail to make sure you know, beyond any doubt we have that this is really a planet. So there are 10,000 waiting. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of planets around other stars. What, and most of them, remember, small. So the opportunities for another planet out there that could be like ours are not bad. I wanted to show you just for a minute the real difference between a Jupiter and an Earth. The Earth is the small blue thing on the left, okay? The Jupiter is the big thing on the right. So all the swirls and gorgeous things you see here, this is actually a picture from a NASA mission called Juno that is flying around Jupiter and makes gorgeous images of Jupiter. Also does a lot of science, but gorgeous images as well. Basically, it shows you that all of the squir swirls here, all of these round and, and uh, floaty things, are actually storms and tornadoes on that planet. And if you heard about that red spot on Jupiter, the Earth would fit whole into that hurricane. You could drop a whole planet in it. It would fit. So gas giants are so different just such a kind of different world. And you wouldn't have any surface to stand on. It's just gas and then the pressure would become so high that gas becomes liquid. So the oxygen you're trying to breathe would become liquid too. So no, do not want to go and dive into Jupiter. Bad idea, really bad idea. We haven't done it with missions either. But it's completely, completely different. So in a way, we're really lucky that it turns out that these rocky planets are much more abundant. So we're talking about 5,000 new worlds that we already know orbiting other stars. And then you might see this a lot, and I just want to bring it up that we have no idea how they look like, OK? I love artist images of exoplanets, but that's what they are, an artist impression. The only thing we know is, if we're lucky, it's a dot of light, OK? Mostly. We only see the star wobble, or we see the star becoming less bright. Everything after that, we have some information on the stars, how far away they are, how hot the planets are around them, and so on. But any colors, any surface, any surfing, or swimming, or jumping on a planet, all an artist's impression. We don't know any of it, but it is gorgeous. So, you know, we assume it will be in all different colors of the rainbow. And we just met a couple of planets. So there's so many planets we don't have in our own system. I said a lot of them are small and rocky, which is great. But for example, we just found a couple of weeks ago one that is just where we think it becomes too hot for ocean, where you would start to boil off all the water. That's, of course, where we think we're going to boil off all our water because we don't have a planet that we can watch boiling off all the water except for this new one. It's called Speculus 2, and my team is working on this and trying to figure out, is it still a hot Earth? Is it already a Venus? Is it already has it lost all its ocean? But because we just brought this telescope into space, we can actually go and check 
We can check if it looks like it is. We can check if it is still a hot earth. And that will also help us figure out what's going to happen to us later. Because every star will actually become brighter with time. That's what they do. They become more luminous with time. Climate change or not, stars over billions of years become brighter. And so how much time do we have before the oceans boil on the Earth? Right? We'll be like 500 million years plus from everything we know. We really hope this planet is a hot Earth because then we're like, okay, we gotta have a little bit more time than we thought. If this planet is already a full-blown Venus, then we're gonna be, ooh, shoot, maybe it's 400 million years. What snack doesn't sound so bad right now, right? As long as we don't come to like 300 million years, you know, and so on and so forth. So the cars out there tell us a lot about how rocky planets work and how ours works. And I've given you this 5,000 number, and I told you that it's really hard to find the small planets like the Earth. So in science, it's really important to know what you can find so that you can figure out what, what your results mean. And so these 5,000 worlds, and they're only about three dozens at the right distance, not too hot and not too cold, and small enough to be an Earth. But we know how many there must be for us to be able to find three dozens right now with the telescopes that are not great yet. Right. They're great telescopes, but they could be greater. Right. So we figured out in a search that every fifth star hosts a planet at the right distance, not too hot, not too cold, and small enough to be a rock. Every fifth. So when you go out, today might not be the best day, but I want you next time you see stars to go out and say one, two, three, four, five. And then you can do it again. It's like, oh, Earth one, Earth two, Earth three, right? Not very reliable for exact this is the Earth three, but every fifth star has a planet that could be like ours. That's amazing. Now, is it like ours? Hmm, that's what we have to figure out. But our Milky Way, our galaxy, has 200 billion stars. So now if you take the math, and you know, back of the analog math, 200 billion stars. One out of five stars has a planet that could be like ours. So then we back to Carl Sagan and the quote he never said, the billions and billions. And I was just gonna add new worlds or maybe alien Earth out there. But how can we actually figure that out? What can we search for? And so I told you about Voyager 1, this mission that was blasted off into space in 1977, 45 years ago, and brought with it the golden record, humankind's message to space. And so what it did before it left the solar system is actually to look back. Carl Sagan convinced the people at NASA, and by convinced I mean he tried again and again and again and again and again, to turn the spacecraft around to have a last look at home. And this is where this idea, this story of the pale blue dot that we heard about comes from. Because this is us, seen from a distance a little bit further away than Saturn, that's us, this dot in space. And so this is what he's talking about when he talks about this pale blue dot and about the vastness of black space around us and how everyone you've ever loved has been living here. And maybe, just maybe, we are just living in the time where we can change that where we can figure out if there are other pale blue dots or pale orange dots out there. But if you have a dot like this, how could you figure out that's an Earth, right? It's a dot, right? It could be a Jupiter, an Earth, a Mars, whatever you want, right? It's a dot, it's a dot of light. Okay, that's it. And we won't have enough light to actually figure out that that's what the dot looks like, right? Because you would need a gigantic telescope to do that. But there's a trick. You can actually have a look at this, not in terms of space, 
so not north, south, west, east, but in terms of colors of light. And if you look at this planet, at our planet, as this pale blue dot, as a color of light, and you split the light up into the colors of the rainbow, this is the infrared, but it's basically exactly the same. The white light goes into different colors of light, and then you figure out, oh, is there a bit like here, this should be a curve. But there's something missing here, like a bite out of an apple, see that? And light and matter interact. When you hit an atom or a molecule with the right energy, it has to be the right energy, like on a guitar, like the strings, they have to be a certain vibration that makes them vibrate. When you hit a molecule with the right energy, it will start to swing and rotate. So remember the light that filters from the star through the atmosphere of the planet to us? The light that gets to me, there's something missing. There's something missing here. This is the infrared, so this is about 50 microns. That means the light encountered CO2. There's something missing at nine microns. That means the light encountered ozone. There's something missing here at six microns. That means the light encountered water vapor. And I know that because in the lab, I can do that. I can just make a box of water vapor and put white light through it and check what comes out on the other side. And then I take that and I compare it to the light that's missing. And so I can read the composition, the chemical makeup of planets around other worlds without going there. It's kind of a cool way of exploration. No ships involved, no scurvy. You can stay at home in front of your computer screen. We all have done the Zoom thing, so we can do this all from our home. But this information is actually incredibly rich. And when you look at the planets in our solar system, the other ones, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and so on and so forth, they actually look very different. And this is just the snapshot. This is the cover of the magazine when we publish this catalog. But you just see that the lines look different, right? For these different kind of worlds. And so we have already a reference fingerprint catalog for our solar system. And now every planet, every light from the planet we get, we can compare against it. It's like, oh, it's another Mars. Oh, that's another Earth. And oh, this looks like nothing we have in our solar system, and let's figure out what that means. And so we have found weird alien planets. I've mentioned that a little bit before, but some of them are actually molten. They have oceans on the surface, but their oceans are made out of lava because they actually need less than at Earth's day, less than 24 hours to swing around their star. Right, so in case you like birthdays, Pick one of those and you can celebrate every day. And it's like, where are my presents? You know, people <laughs> catch up. You know, you might want to pick one that lets you recover one day in between, but there are weird planets out there that just zoom around their star and then get so hot that everything we know, this is again an artist impression, that rock would melt. So there would have to be lava on these worlds. But going back in time, our planet is actually pretty weird too. Because if you think about it, in the beginning, this is what Earth looked like. There were all these pieces smashing together, building the planet. And so in the beginning, Earth was actually a lava world covered with molten rock. And then something hit it and made the moon. And so when you think about the first tides, you know, remember when the waves get higher, the water on the oceans, the first ever tides on the Earth was a huge magma wave just going around the whole planet. So not a good place to live yet. Okay. Our planet was pretty weird too through its evolution. However, that means it gives us a key of what to look for. And usually we think about, you know, yes, continents move through time, Himalayas formed and so on. So it looks a bit different, but if you go back in time, Earth became more and more different. And if you think about it like a 24-hour clock, the life of Earth, that 4.5 billion years, then life started somewhere around 3 a.m., uh, about 4 billion years ago. The oldest sure traces of life 
about 3.5 billion, and oxygen starts to build up about lunchtime. So the Earth has always been modified by life. But initially, biota makes CO2 and methane that you cannot really distinguish from volcanoes. But then around lunchtime, it started to make another waste gas, oxygen. That, as I said, killed about 95% of all life on the Earth because oxygen didn't know what it was doing, didn't want to reflect on what it was doing, and didn't want to change its way of what it was doing. You know, lesson learned there, hopefully, because I would like to not die out. But it actually provided oxygen, which provides much more energy. Thus, you can make a much more complicated kind of life, multicellular, animals, dinosaurs, humans. So again, this change in the air of the planet actually changes the life fingerprint. And it corresponds to different kinds of environments, of course, on the Earth, right? And this is what we are used to green, trees, grass, but it's pretty new, 750 million years ago only, that this actually is here on the Earth. And this is just a lot of wiggly lines, but remember when I said there's something missing? Changing the age of our own planet, so you go from the top to down, top is modern, and the bottom is Earth when it was really young, you see that it looks different because it had a different chemical makeup, a different air, and that's what we can look for. So using our planet as a key, we can look for planets at different ages, stages of the evolution, with these new big telescopes. But one of the last things, two more points that I want to make, that I wanted to mention is, when you look around and it's green, it's great, right? It's trees, it's grass, and so on, but Life on the Earth is so much more versatile. Remember when in the beginning when I told you it could be a red dot, could be a green dot, could be a yellow dot? Life, life, life on the Earth is incredibly weird and versatile and normally we don't think about most of it. And so this is just cute. I like this one. But this is super interesting. It's not so cute when it opens its mouth, but it's a water bear and it's super cute and it's tiny. It can basically live everywhere. It's called a tardy bird. You can cook it, boil it, freeze it, put it out into space without a spacesuit. It's gonna be fine. Bring it back in, put some water on it. It's like da 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 da. We'll lay some egg and be fine. I sat next to a person at the conference. That's like, do you know that you can freeze these things? Or like have these things dry out for 100 years and they're still alive? And he was like, 275. I was like, what? It was like, happened to be the director of the Natural History Museum in Paris, who just had done this experiment and put some water on one of these dry rocks, and then they were apparently two tardigrades who were like, okay, we're good, you know? And so, we are life on our planet. And so the question is, can that life actually start somewhere else? We don't know. But we have done something with this incredible team here at Cornell, but we just said, well, what about if you can? Let's collect as many life samples that are colorful, because color means we can see them by telescope, from all over the world, you know, from deserts, from icy places, from hot places, just to know what a planet would look like if life were very different. And so we call it the color catalog of life, and you can just browse it at the Carl Sagan Institute. It's completely for anyone. So if you're interested, what kind of weird colors and shapes life could have, you know, microbial life, knock yourself out. And this is how we want to use it. So what we've just recently done here at Cornell and the person is in the room in case you have questions, uh, is basically say, well, there's actually life that could survive in ice and it could color that ice. It's one of the problems we, for example, have with climate change, right? If the ice is actually becoming less reflective because biota goes onto the glaciers, it melts faster because it doesn't reflect as much light. However, turn it around, it means you could see it. Watermelon snow, the kind of reddish, pinkish snow, there could be a pink, icy world out there, right? Pink, icy igloos somewhere in another world. Maybe, maybe not. But it's probably interesting and important to know what to look for just in case that happens. 
And I told you about the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's basically the last picture we have from the telescope when it just separated from its rocket and launched out into space where it beautifully unfolded and is now already giving us gorgeous images. In case you've seen those, this is an image of a star forming region where we can actually, about 7,000 light years from the away, from here, where we can see stars and their planets just being born. And in case you were wondering, this is in comparison between Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope. So you see it's bigger, you get a lot more details and because it looks for a heat signature, it also lets us penetrate through some of these nebulas to see more. And so it's great for science, but it's also great for space art in case you need something from your screensaver or you need to actually put something up on your dormer. And here, for example, are stars that are just being formed right now. They're making planets right now. And but then because when stars get born, you know, cosmic dust is actually pushed away by the radiation from a newborn star. So we can see that happening. I wouldn't say in real time because it all happened 7,600 years ago because light needs time to travel. But for us in real time, the light's just getting here. And that just leads me to one point. In case you want another connection, not just your face in the mirror in the morning, you know, billions of years and stars, there is actually always, if you're more than four year old, most people are, there's always a star whose light just reaches us right now that was sent out when you were born. Let's just in your 20s. Find a star 20 light years away. Watch it tonight. Light's coming right now to us because light needs 20 years to get to us from 20 light years away from the year that you were born. It's a great present doesn't cost you anything, and most people won't have it. And it changes every year, because then you're 21, and so then you need another star. So it's a present that keeps on giving. That's the practical part of this evening lecture, in case you wonder about Christmas presents already. And the last thing that I wanted to leave you with, when we looking for planets, we learn so much about our place in the universe, we learn so much about our planet and how it works. We look at Mars, we figure out what happens if there's a lot of dust in the air. We look at Venus, we figure out what happens when you put too much CO2 in the air. And sometimes it's actually even an interesting question to say like, well, what about if we change that view? We are looking for aliens, okay? Are we looking for life out there? Well, actually, shouldn't there be places where if they just had the right, the same technology that we do, where we would be the aliens? And it's actually an interesting question because let's assume you need to transit. That defines a region in the sky that actually could see us just with the right way, that it could see the planet go between us and the sun. And so they would actually see us as a transiting, transiting planet. And they could see us the oxygen since about two billion years ago. So in case you're wondering if we should send out signals to say we're here, the cat's out of the bag for about two billion years because we're breathing, right? You could get rid of the oxygen in the air to hide us, but that would probably introduce a lot more problems that it would solve. <laughs> so we have about 2,000 stars within about 300 light years that could actually see us right now. And a couple of those, 75 actually, they are also within the distance where our radio wave would have reached them already. So they could see us transit, block light from the star, see if there's oxygen, and then they would listen to terrible music, right? For a while. So in case you're wondering why nobody has contacted us yet, think about the playlist you had in high school and wonder if somebody would on that calling card want to call you, right? I'm sure you all had an amazing high school playlist. I did not. I'm not listening to that music anymore. I have dissociated myself from that music completely. So light has time to travel. So the good music would get there later. But a couple of those actually host planets in the habitable zone. 
that could potentially be like ours. And so that's kind of really interesting. But this vantage point where you can see a planet actually transit is gained and lost. You only have it for an average of about a thousand years. And so one of these planets, uh, tea garden stars, actually pretty funny, they would have seen Earth's transit like 3,000 years ago, and they lost the vantage point 900 years ago, if there's any day, if anybody were looking, right? And then the question is like, 900 years ago, would anybody have figured out there's intelligent life on this Earth that you would like to talk to? So again, if you're wondering why nobody's here, there's a lot of answers to that question. That might not mean there's total silence out there. So I really like this. And so when we, when we published this paper, there were a couple of news articles and it's like at least 2,000 ways Earth has blown its cover. And another paper was like, are you feeling watched? <laughs> and I was like, well, I wish people, right? Because the only thing I can look for is oxygen. I would like to have a telescope where I could actually look into the house of an alien civilization and watch them, right? So don't worry, if you're feeling watched, they're only gonna see your whole planet as one dot of light, it's not gonna be you, and it's probably gonna be four to 100 years ago, so you don't have to worry about it yet. And so, there'll be a lot of adventures. I think a lot of adventures in our lifetime because we have the telescope right now in the sky, and we have thousands of planets that we found already. And could there be life out there? What about if a star becomes bigger? What about a planet that was first frozen? Would it unfreeze? Would it become a water world? Kevin Costner is probably not in the picture for most people here, but you know, what would happen on such a world? And so going from that, I just wanted to also show you, this is the last slide. So we live in 4,000 worlds. We have a huge diversity that teaches about our own planet and how to keep it safe. The key really to find life has to be the whole diversity of the Earth in its evolution through time because that's what we can already look for. And then, of course, the question is where we are the aliens. Here, this is an image that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, part of NASA made, of a system that's called TRAPPIST-1 that has seven Earth-sized planets going around one sun and four of them are within this right distance, not to be too cold and not too hot. And so this is the vision, again, completely artistic vision. We have no idea if there's life on there, about what they would see. And what I love about this one is, this is us. This will be us in their night sky. They would see the sun, because the sun is a really bright star for them in the night sky. So if anybody were looking, we will be a bright, nearby target in their sky. However, it's really interesting. Remember when I said, where are we the aliens? This system specifically, we've already seen their stars, but it's not a, I see you, you see me. It's more like two ships going past each other at the night. It's gonna take 1,300 years before they will see us. So it's kind of really interesting whether or not there's a super advanced civilization somewhere out there, maybe, just maybe, we know something they don't yet. Anyway, and with that, thank you very much for your attention, and please ask any questions. Thank you everyone for coming to um, our last uh, in our lecture series for this semester. Uh, we'd like to take questions now before we head up to Fuertes for the rest of our programming. Um, okay. Cool if I can. Yeah.
flies wouldn't be able to see that, really? Yeah, I think that's a really great question, right? So what about if somewhere else, let's assume there are some civilizations out there, they would be very different. They would perceive things very different. Well, one of the things you can think about is even if you have, think about life on the earth that doesn't rely on their eyes, right? They will rely on something like vibration on the earth, right? For one thing, the deep oceans or so on. But there will be some kind of interaction of any life form with its environment. But you're completely right. What about if they have a completely different way of communicating or seeing? And this gets us back to why haven't we received any messages yet? It's kind of funny that we actually assume we would notice the message if it comes by, right? Well, we would notice, like, oh, oh, they would know that they have to speak English and make a radio telescope. I'm like, well, well, why, you know? And then it's like, why would they speak English? Maybe they have actually, I have this in my class, I'm like, have you tried to talk to a jellyfish lately? My students like, what? Ask a one-on-one, Ivy League, just in case you want to come, right? So, try to talk to a jellyfish is one of our things. And I can't, right? I see the jellyfish in front of me, but I can't communicate, even so this thing evolved on my planet and so on and so forth. So, you could imagine, and this is of course completely made up, that somebody has already, some hundreds of years, sent us jellyfish signals, and the jellyfish are like, yeah, they're there, and we're like, where are the aliens? Where are the aliens? And the jellyfish are like, hey, people, you know, aren't you the people looking, you know? So communication and perceiving signals, exactly as you asked, you know, it could be very different. And then how do we do that? And so this is in a way why I see this research as a trick, because by looking at the light in the air of a planet, I can find life whether it wants to be found or not, right? And I'll reverse. People can, you can figure out that the Earth was inhabited by life that changed its atmosphere for about two billion years, and there's nothing we can do about it because it's oxygen. And so in a way, that helps us. And there might be a subsection of civilizations that can perceive each other even if there's like lots of life in the universe. And if you really think about it and how or what it would take to communicate, it actually starts to blow your mind how complicated it's gonna even get. And this is when I go back to the jellyfish, I'm like, maybe we should start with the jellyfish once we actually have that. We go to, I don't know, a crab or an underwater eel, whatever you want, right? You know, just like communication is gonna be so much harder than just finding life in case we ever get to it. But I think we'll rise to the challenge once we have a good enough uh, reason to. Sorry, I don't know how this works. There are at least some communications which could be, which would probably be fairly obvious. Like, for instance, But again, how do you perceive it, right? Is it light? <coughs> is it radio? Is it something you need to have a but detector? But you probably use some sort of electromagnetic radiation because the concept of like, what else would be be using, would be being used if you're trying to communicate with another with another alien with an alien civilization? Absolutely. If we were to communicate with another alien civilization, we would do that. If you were a whale living in the deep parts of yes, the ocean, but if you were a whale, yes, but a whale living in the deep part wouldn't have the ability to communicate over multiple light years. Uh, if you're communicating with multiple over multiple light years, you're probably doing it with some sort of electromagnetic radiation, unless you figured out some way to like strongly interact with neutrinos or whatever. And if you do that, you probably learn how to use electromagnetic radiation at some point beforehand. True, but on the other hand, would you actually? It's a really good question. How will we communicate? Uh, I don't know. I think it would be really interesting to figure that out. Um, if we would be in the red dot from Jupiter planet, um, would we get sucked off of the outside of our planet? Yeah, so I would not recommend to go and visit the Jupiter red dot because it's a huge tornado 
and not even the whole earth will be safe because it's so big. So we're not gonna get to Jupiter, not anytime soon. We're gonna keep a safe distance, but that's very smart. Keeping a safe distance from dangerous places like tornadoes, I completely agree. Um, can I ask what you do for your research? So what I do for my research is I actually model these planets. And I think about what would it look like in the light fingerprint if there were light from a planet versus not? Would I actually see any difference in the telescope? If I don't, that means I can find life even if it's out there. If I do, that means that's a really interesting planet to look at. And then I figure out all the things that I'm missing. Like, how would an algae bloom actually look to me on another world? Well, nobody's measured an algae bloom here, like that way, because biologists don't need that. They know algae is algae, right? They do the DNA, that's not gonna help me. I wanna know what the reflection is. And so we do a lot of that information. One of my other postdocs is also here, is actually melting his own planets in the lab. So we basically generate our own planets in the lab and melt them, and I was so excited until I figured out that that planet was like this big. But it's okay, you know, we're very effective and we're very good in melting and there are no lava streams in the lab, so that's all good. Because when you melt different rocks, they will look different, right? One will look a little bit more orange, one will look a bit more red and so on and so forth. And again, you can use that when you look at lava worlds to figure out what they're made of. And so my research is a lot of theory and then I have incredibly talented people who can go to the lab and not kill everything they touch. So I very highly appreciate it, because I tried growing things once and I killed about 97% of all the biota I tried to save. So at that point I decided theory is a really good place for me. <laughs> working mic again? I have a working mic again. Okay, go. Okay. Um, so how do you determine um, if there is multiple planets or one larger planet, depending on the wobble of the, the star? Thank you very much for the question. I keep forgetting to say that because I've been doing this for so long. So when you go around the star, uh, depending on how far away the planet is, that means it needs a certain time to go around. So Kepler figured that out a while ago. And so the Earth takes a year to go around the sun, Jupiter, further away, takes about 11 years to go around the sun because it's basically a balance between the gravitational pull of the star versus how fast the planet has to move not to get actually sucked in or not to be dragged in. And so what that means is that there will be wobbles on top of wobbles, right? So there will be for the Earth a wobble every one year. There will be a second wobble on the star every 11 years. And it sounds very complicated, but what we do in physics and astronomy, we just actually look at the signal over time. And then we find time periods where the signal repeats. So you can take the one year wobble of the Earth out and check, oh, is there a second wobble in there? It's like, oh, there's a second wobble every 11 years. That's Jupiter. And so we found systems up to eight planets, actually, so like ours. And you do it exactly like that. And it's actually in Fourier space, where you look at periodicity, it's just beautiful, you know, it's just beautiful pikes, spikes. And the spikes tell you, okay, this is one planet goes at this period, one planet needs this how many days or months. And so you can tell it apart pretty easily. And for the planets who block out the lights, the same, right? You see like, oh, 10% light loss. Oh, now it's only 1%, something's weird. And it's like, oh, it's 10% again. Ha, two planets, right? One only does 1%, the other one has 10%. And when it happens, tells you how long it needs to go around, thus how far away the planet is from the star, thus how warm it is there. All back to Kepler. Thank you for the great presentation. So how do you approximate or estimate like the properties of the planet, like surface, temperature, all of that solely based on light? Great question. How do we do that? Well, you know, if you actually, so I said this, this wobble technique, right? That basically tells you how massive the planet is. And then how much it blocks from the star's light tells you how big it is. So what that tells you is you, if you're looking at a rock or you're looking at a gas ball. 
And the comparison here that I find very useful is if you had a huge bathtub, cosmic bathtub, you throw Saturn in, the one with the rings, that actually swims on top of water because the mean density of Saturn is lighter than water, while if you throw the Earth in this hypothetically huge bathtub, it would actually sink like a stone. So that's the first thing you need to know. Are you looking at a gas giant or are you looking at a rocky planet? And if it's a rocky planet, then you can ask, okay, so if I had the Earth, and I actually have an analog to the Earth, just the exact same one, how close could I shift it before it loses its all its ocean? And how far away can I put it from the star because it's before it freezes over? And that's how we define what we call the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone that you might have heard of in the news. It basically is defined based on the Earth. And if I move the Earth where it still would have liquid water on the surface, one of the key ingredients for life. And so that's how we make the distinction. So we say if it were an Earth, it would have this kind of temperature. Right? It could survive, or no, it would get so hot that it would lose all its water. Water is a very effective greenhouse gas, it would get hotter and hotter and hotter. Or we can say, well, what about if it were Venus? How hot would it get then? So usually what we do is we have different cases. And we say, if this were like the Earth, you know, it's a rock, if it actually had water, what's likely, because stuff in the universe gets a lot of water around. And then we say, so how hot would it get? And that's what we do. We make an equivalent. We say, if this were an Earth, this is how hot it would be. If it were a Venus, this is how hot it would get. This is how. So we don't really know, except for some of the really hot planets, because they are so hot that our telescopes can actually catch their glow. And then you can say from that how hot it is. But those are the bad ones. Those are the lava worlds with 2,000 degrees and the hot planets. So for those, we can give you actually a direct measurement of how hot they are. For the other ones, we just infer, assuming it would be an Earth analog or not. Okay, I think mine is still working, sorry. Yeah. Test, test, okay. Now, now that we know that uh, they're way beyond what we consider the habitable zone, there can be heat because of tidal heating, such as the uh, satellites of Jupiter and Saturn. Now that we know that the, the heat requirement in order for keeping uh, liquid water liquid can be done way beyond the, uh, the cab habitable, zone, habitable zone, and now that we know that there are ecosystems on Earth that do not depend on sunlight, what about looking beyond the habitable zone for those same signals? Absolutely, great, great suggestion. And we actually considered this, but the habitable zone, and thank you for bringing And so the problem I have, and the only way to break that is with life that actually could live in the ice, on the ice. If there's a huge ice layer on top of the ocean that has the life, right? Even on our solar system, if there is life, we have to go there and actually drill a hole and check the water. So if you take that planet and move it light years away where I can't get to, it's basically hiding any kind of life form from me. So the habitable zone is not where we think there's life. It is actually where we think there's life and we can find it just because of the light without getting there. And so really, it should be called the liquid water zone around the star, not the habitable zone. But the liquid water zone around the star is just really boring. And so Goldilocks zone or habitable zone is much better. But absolutely, it's not where like there can be life. It is the subset from where we think there can be life plus where we can find it, like the lamppost kind of thing a little bit. But before we can get there and actually drill through the ice, there's no other way we have than just looking at the light. And so our team, and Lucia is in the back there, is actually, that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to find something else. Can life live on the ice? Could we actually catch those kind of planets that are frozen over? Could we catch life on those because they make a big enough change on the surface in terms of color from white to pink, from white to whatever you want to find it? We don't know yet, but we have the catalog to figure out what we should be looking for. But that's really the problem is the practicality. What is
the strangest exoplanet you ever heard of. Ooh, now we gotta be here another two hours. No, uh, I will let you go. So there are uh, exoplanets, you know, and, and the funniest part about this is, so okay, let's start with this one. Would you like a planet that's made out of marshmallows? <laughs> See, we have one taker already for a planet made out of marshmallow. So the key point is that if I give you the mean density, right? If I know the radius and the mass, I can tell you on average what the density is. And there are planets out there where the average density is the marshmallow or cotton candy. That doesn't mean they're made out of marshmallow or cotton candy. It would just be so funny because some of them are really hot. So I'm thinking about s'mores every time I think about these planets. But they're hydrogen, right? They're hydrogen and helium, but by chance, it falls, and so, you know, a marshmallow planet, I just thought it was super funny. Uh, there are planets where it's gonna rain rocks, these lava worlds, right, because you're gonna evaporate some of those rocks, some of this lava, but then further away from the planet, it's gonna get cold. So then it's gonna fall back down, and so it's like, well, definitely not a good place to visit, you know, no way, you're like running away from the whole, uh, not getting hit by big boulders kind of rain thing. And then, again, mean density, right? So you'll be like, oh, this planet should be made out of diamonds. That made the news, right? Again, it's not made out of diamonds, but you know, the mean density is like marshmallows or like uh, cotton candy. I think the weirdest planets for me, just because I can't wrap my head around it, are the planets that need less than 24 hours to go around their star. Because I just don't know how that would work. Right, because you have the star and you have this thing moving like zzzz, and it's still there. Because it's hot, so it actually should lose most of its atmosphere because it evaporates, but it's just doing a zzzz. And nobody expected them to exist. So I think for me, those are still the weirdest planets are there. And we have no explanation, no good explanation yet why they are there. There are a lot of good explanations how they got there, but you know how they survived and still are there is kind of still are there any planets uh, no, sorry. are there any telescopes that has like pointed back at the earth like with a blue, uh, a blue dot that actually to observe the spectral lines to see what we would look like Thank you, so uh, thank you for the question. Yes, and this was in 1993, Carl Sagan paper, where he actually said there was a Galileo vision that went to Mars and did a swing by by the Earth. And Carl Sagan had this brilliant idea, visionary as always, saying like, well, we should test. And they were like, well, test what? And they were like, well, you know, if we have a spacecraft flying by the Earth and we can't find life on the Earth, right? Then probably our spacecrafts are not as well equipped as we think they are and that's the 1993 paper. But it's incredibly hard to make people look back, and so I alluded a little bit to, you know, the pale blue dot image, that Carl Sagan was basically insisting and insisting and insisting that they turn around and take a picture of the Earth, because that's not what these things are built for. Right, these things are built for observing Jupiter or Uranus or whatever you want to do. And so actually getting people to turn their camera around and use it for something that's not used or designed for is, is incredibly hard. It would be great to just park a small telescope somewhere far away and look at the changes that happen in the Earth through time, right? Like even if it's just a year, if it's months, if it's weeks, but it's not falling into the purview of Earth observation because they stay in Earth orbit, and it's also not falling in the purview of astronomy because they don't do that. So anyway, doing this for extra solar planets is probably the closest we can get. But we beg, borrow, and steal. It's like, what about if you just look back at the Earth for a little bit, right? What about if you did this in a month again, you know? So we have some colleagues that, colleagues that we can convince to do it, but it would be great to have much more information on that. I completely agree. I think we have time for probably one or two more questions before we go on with our... Um, what are some, like, geological differences between Earth and like the other Earths? And like, is it possible to identify those from really far away? Great questions. 
This is exactly what I ask myself all the time. So the questions you guys are coming up with, I actually get to do in my research, or I get to ponder about how the heck anybody could do that. And one of the questions that I had is geological activity, right? And I was like, hey, I don't know, anybody else got stuck on the ground when there was a volcano in Iceland erupting? I got stuck on the ground. And I was like, ooh, maybe you could see a volcano on another planet. And then we actually figured that out because we basically took everything we knew about the biggest explosion, Pinatuba, and put it on an exoplanet and said, could we actually see Pinatuba on another exoplanet? Turns out, you would need about 10 Pinatubas to see them on an exoplanet, so if 10 Pinatubas at the same time would actually explode on another exoplanet, what, you know, if you have a more active planet might actually be possible, then you could actually see it in the air. So what you need is a geological feature or a geological thing of the planet that changes the air or the surface of the planet substantially enough for me to tell the difference. But that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. And one of the things is probably geological activity. If there are no volcanoes at all, you don't have a stabilizing climate cycle on a planet, and so then the air and the temperature would look very different. Um, so, uh, you guys at the Sagan, as you mentioned at one point that you guys are doing some, also some research on uh, planets in our solar system. So, and I, um, I, you also brought up the sort of the, the concept that, of uh, the Fermi paradox, of course, why, why aren't we, um, why haven't we found life? Um, but what, there, there is, I think there is an argument to say that perhaps we aren't finding life because we aren't really looking for it, even in our solar system. I mean, right now, there are no missions planned to Enceladus, for example. There are two to Europa, but none of them are landing on Europa. Like, I feel like we, we, have, we have launched loads and loads of rovers to Mars and to all of these other planets with very low chances of life, but we are somehow weirdly missing out on the planets with the highest, or the regions with the highest chance of discovering life. So what are you guys at the Sagan Institute doing to maybe address this sort of the sort of the interest gap between the planets that could have real life and the planets that are easy to get to, let's say. Absolutely. So uh, for example, one of the fellows at the Carl Sagan Institute, John Lonai, is actually the PI of the mission to Enceladus that they're proposing, trying to actually fly through some of the plumes to figure out if there's uh, you know organics in it. And uh, we just never had a telescope like it. And the problem is there is something to be said. You have to be extremely careful, just like as a side note, about the solar system, because what you don't want is hitchhikers. You cannot, okay, it's actually quite scary once you start to actually research this. It's really hard to kill life on Earth. It's good that it's really hard to kill life on Earth, but it's really hard to kill life on a rover. And so when you land, and let's assume five years later, you find life on Mars, and it looks exactly like life on the Earth. Is it a second genesis? Did we bring it along? And so we try our best not to bring things along. And so it would be great if we don't land, right? If we could do a logic remotely or fly through plumes that got shot out into the air so that we don't contaminate another planet. And there's also, um, um, oh God, how do you call it? Planet protection. There's a borough for planet protection. The more likely something is that we can get to, to have life, the more stringent the conditions are of what we're allowed to do. Because the idea is that, you know, for better or for worse, I think we've grown a little bit. We don't want to go there and have our microbes be like, mmm, food, let's just kill all the Martian microbes while we add it. And you're like, no, 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 we didn't actually, oh man, annihilation. So we're trying to be very careful. And so it's mission step after step. And let me just get back to it, and then please, if you have other questions, just come up. But I just wanted to, because you gave me this beautiful end with the Fermi question. So, where is everybody? And so, if, let me just turn this completely around with you, right? So instead of there actually being no life out there, and thus we have not been visited, and we have no messages, and so on. What about if there is, hypothesis, lots of life out there? Hundreds, thousands of civilizations. When I ask, and actually, I'm just gonna do this as the last thing. Okay, I'm telling you, I have two planets, hypothesis, right? So this is not happening, but if I said I had two planets with signs of life on them, 
and I had the money to send a signal of a go to one of the two, okay? You have to pick one of two planets. One planet is 10,000 years younger than us. One planet is 10,000 years older than us. Who would want to go to the older planet to say hi? Same, we, we just have the same, everything's exactly the same. It's just like one planet is 10,000 years older, one is 10,000 younger. True, but without knowing anything, I just give you one that's 10,000 years older and one that's 10,000 years younger. Okay, who wants the younger one? Okay. And everybody who had not stretched their arm, this is now your chance to stretch their arm. My students love me for not getting them out of doing this. Okay, older one, show of hands. Okay, younger one, show of hands. Ooh, you guys are very uncommon. Because, think about it this way, 10,000 years ago, you can watch the grass grow on our planet, right? In terms of excitement. I'm hoping that 10,000 years from now is going to be so much more interesting, right? And most people, except for people in this room apparently, actually consistently pick the older planet because they actually want a more advanced civilization. And yes, we do not know what the advancement is, you know, but with everything we know, older probably means more advanced. And then if you turn that around as the Fermi solution, right, why would you visit us? We have steps on the moon. We haven't even made it to Mars yet. If, big if, there's a lot of civilizations out there and they're really interesting and doing super cool stuff and like technology, highly advanced, why would they want to speak to us? I love our planet, but maybe we are not that interesting yet. And with that, thank you all very much and come up with your other questions. On behalf of Cornell Astronomical Society, we're honored to welcome Professor Lisa Kaltenegger for our last lecture series of the semester. Thank you so much. I have a few more announcements before we all head out of here. Uh, number one, the, uh, the fun continues in the celebration of the late Professor Carl Sagan's 88th birthday. We're all going up to Square Sheets Observatory for our weekly Friday night public open house. We hope to see you there. Um, skies aren't very clear, but we still have a, a wonderful old building um, to explore. Uh, in addition, tonight in particular, um, in honor of Professor Sagan's birthday, um, our outreach coordinator, Gillis Lowry, will be leading a discussion um, of his life and work uh, in the Square Chase classroom around 9.30 onward. Uh, and we'll have showings of his 1980 TV show, Cosmos, uh, in the classroom all night long. Um, there is lots more apple pie back there if you haven't already helped yourselves. We've got stickers on all the tables that we hope you take. And the, uh, the last announcement is that all of this is made possible through the, um, the generous funding of the Student Activities Funding Committee. And for us to continue getting that funding, we need proof that you are all here. If you haven't already checked in to this event to show your attendance, um, CAST President Annika Deutsch is by the door with a laptop, um, happy to take down names. It really helps us out a lot um, if you can, if we can say that you were here. <laughs>